Relax. I don't know if the door closed to me. The told me the thing. No, they didn't close the lights. No, they didn't close the lights. Alright, I'm here for the door closed and then it's time for service to begin. So <laughs> I just wanted to make sure. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, my name is Daphina Ward, and I'm the executive director of the Southern AIDS Coalition. I'm so glad to have y'all in the room this morning. Um, we're gonna do a reflection in a moment, and as a part of that, we'll get a chance to do introductions. But if it's okay with you, and since we're at a faith conference, I'd like to start our session with a word of prayer. Is there any objection to that? Is that all right with everybody? Okay. All right, let's take a moment and close our eyes. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to share space with one another, to dig deep together to the idea of building partnerships that are intentional, dear God, and in service to the communities that we want to impact and elevate and empower. We pray a special prayer this morning that you touch the hearts of anyone who has been harmed by stigma, by bias, who's been made to feel ashamed in a house of worship or in any space, that you provide healing and love and comfort and reassurance that we are each your children, each loved, each cherished, dear God. We pray a special prayer also for those who are the ones who create situations of discomfort, that whether intentionally or unintentionally create spaces that make folks feel ashamed and unloved. We bind up a spirit, dear God, of anything that is not like you, that is judgmental, that is harmful, that is hurtful. And we just pray that we do the work in a way that is uplifting, that we leave this space feeling reassured that we are in alignment with the journey you have for us to do good work, and that we sow seeds here that will go out into our various communities and will just create an impact, just a garden, dear God, among folks who need it most. In your name we pray, amen. amen. All right, you're fine. Good morning. All right. So, um, Southern AIDS Coalition, I have to acknowledge um, Mardrigas Harris, our Director of Community Investments, who's here with us, as well as DeAsia Lee, who is our Compass Programs Manager, and who made this very cool um, <laughs> video thing that I use in every presentation because I think it's so cool. Um, and please talk to DeAsia about our work with the Gilead Compass Initiative. She leads that work for the Southern AIDS Coalition Coordinating Center, and we're one of the four coordinating, center, coordinating centers that works with Wake Forest and Emory Rollins School of Public Health and um, University of Houston Graduate College of Social Work to do this work around bringing more resources to the South. Um, and so Southern AIDS Coalition, I'll give you a quick spiel. We have been around for 20 plus years and were founded over 20 years ago with a focus on bringing um, equitable resources to Southern communities to address our HIV and AIDS epidemic, recognizing that federal resources were going to the coast and not coming down to the South because of the way the formularies were designed. And that's really where our organization came from. There were a lot of state AIDS directors in the South, community-based organization leaders and advocates who just got fed up and just started putting in the work. Um, and so we've evolved over 20 years. And here we are now, an organization that does grant making and leadership development, capacity building assistance, intersectional policy advocacy, and really try to do anything in response to what the community is telling us it needs in Southern states. So that's who we are. And so this conversation around building partnerships is like right up our alley. This is what we try to do, to build partnerships and relationships that are meaningful and intentional um, and really in, in true partnership and collaboration with communities in the South. So that's who we are. All right, so we're gonna begin. I'm not gonna have you like an icebreaker and tell me what you excited about this summer and your favorite color and all that. But it feels like if we're gonna talk about partnership, then we should start by grounding ourselves in relationship. And when we talk about strategic partnerships in the context of HIV stigma, then we definitely are gonna be talking about barriers. We'll likely be talking about a lot of challenges. 
So I'm hoping that we can set ourselves for this conversation thinking and reflecting on a positive relationship. So I'd love for everyone to sit with a moment. It's your choice if you'd like to close your eyes or not to reflect on a relationship that brings a smile to your face. Sit in the feeling of being understood, your needs met, your heart joyful. And where does that come from for you? Let's take a moment. So it would be great, we'll go around, do a quick introduction, tell us who you are, um, your pronouns, where you're from, and if you'd like to share just a little bit about that moment of reflection for you, we'd love to hear that. Um, start with Kevin. Josh Kogan, he, him, I'm here in Dallas, and um, I'm a newlywed, so the relationship that came to mind is my wife, so. Thank you. Ray Jordan live here in Dallas, Texas. Uh, when I thought about a particular relationship, I thought about friends that I have. Mm -hmm. uh, two particular good friends that help me feel seen and understood. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Gordon Angus Van Antonio. I'm from Little Rock, Arkansas, from the Stradlight Foundation there. We're a community-based and serving organization. Um, I guess my, my pronouns are he, him, and his. Uh, the moment of gratitude I had, uh, I just got some messages from some people who are observing me being here, and they appreciate that. That was that was wonderful. Thank you. Thanks. Hi everyone. Again, my name is Deja Lee. I'm the Compass Program Manager with the Southern AIDS Coalition. My pronouns are she and her. Um, and what I thought about was my relationship with my friends, and what stood out to me in that moment was reciprocity, mm -hmm. um, and feeling understood, and feeling that. You give someone what they need, but they also give you what you need to stay. Thank you. Hello, my name is Carla Mena. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm the director of SEVA, or Capacity Building Assistance Operations with the Hands United uh, Latino Commission of AIDS. <laughs> it's a mouthful. Mm -hmm. I'm here from uh, Valley, North Carolina, and what came to mind was just like all of what has been happening. Um, and in relation to my like fiance, who will soon be my wife, um, so just feeling a lot of emotions and gratitude for even being in this space. Fantastic. Thank you. It's good to see you again. I didn't realize yes, you were my yeah. <laughs> Hi, my name is Karen Pineda. Pronouns she, her, hers, and I work with Carla on a capacity building assistance specialist. And what came to mind was my mom. Mm -hmm. Sorry, please, please. Oh, <laughs> I'm uh, Renee McCoy. I'm uh, uh, she hers, and I am project manager at uh, African American HHH Ministry in Seattle. And I, I manage uh, uh, HIV related projects. So, been doing HIV for a long time and retired and you know, came back. I'm loving it. Um, <laughs> And and y'all don't judge, but my relate my uh, reflection was on my puppies. I have, <laughs> I have two dogs. Uh, they're litter mates. Uh, they're fourteen months old now. But I, what makes me smile about my 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 pups is that um, every day is new with them, and every day they're happy to see me. Uh, no matter what, we work it out. <laughs> Take care of shit. <laughs> we work it out. Uh, and, um, and I didn't know there were so many dogs in Dallas. I mean, dogs, yes. dogs, dogs. So I've missed them so much since I've been here. But they're my puppies. Thank you. And I think that should have been the title for this session. They tear up shit and we work it out. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a subtitle right there. <laughs> Marjorie <laughs> Kiss. <laughs> Marjorie Kiss Harris, Director of Community Investments with the Southern AIDS Coalition. My relationship uh, that I thought about that brings me so much joy is my nephew. I have two nieces, one nephew, and the joy he brings is because his love is so pure, mm -hmm. it's untainted. 
is without motive right now until he gets older and realizes I'm the uncle that can do stuff his mom and daddy won't do for him. Yeah. So right now it's without motive and judgment. <laughs> and it has so, nothing to do that he looks just like you. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> 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 Thank you. He's going to get you too. You just wait. I can't wait. Get your, get your money ready. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Good morning. My name is Marion Lewis, and my pronouns are she and hers. And um, I am the president and CEO of Jerusalem House, which is Atlanta's oldest and largest provider of permanent supportive housing mm -hmm. for people with no place to be. And um, my moment of uh, gratitude, I was really just reflecting on my relationship, but also friendships. And just recently, last weekend, spent some time with a really good friend of mine from college. And we did like a dessert tour of Detroit this nice. week. We like ate one end to the next, and it was a lot of fun. So lots of laughter. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Vanessa Castro. She's her pronouns and the Associate Director of HIV and Health Equity at the Human Rights Campaign Foundation. And I would say, mine is two. I don't have puppies, but I've seen your dogs with the mind of the puppies because they're spoiled. And then also my grandmother. Um, those two together really bring a lot of joy in my life. Mm -hmm. Thank you all for sharing. And I know we can hold that in our hearts all day as we have hard conversations. And sometimes it's just nice to remember that you are that you're loved. Your relationships don't have to be perfect for you to bring you joy and bring a smile to your face. So thank you for that. I also reflected on a friend. I had a girlfriend visit who I had not seen in seven years. We've been friends since we were four. And I promise you, it felt like we had just seen each other the day before. Like, it's just beautiful to have those friendships where it's like, girl, so I can just kick right back up. And that's such a beautiful thing. So thank you all for sharing. So our objectives, you know, we have a lot of different objectives, but I've named two. Um, so our, in our time today, we'll identify some steps um, to developing meaningful, sustained um, and sustainable partnerships. And so we'll walk through a formula of steps to do that and then provide some, and we'll do some application together. And then it's also an, op an opportunity for us to identify barriers in our own experiences, where have we seen barriers come up in, in efforts to build partnership, um, and all of this in the context of HIV-related stigma. I think it's important to start with making sure we're all speaking the same language. So I'm going to ask folks, if you have your cell phone, to, I hope, I think everybody has a phone, um, to take a picture of this QR code. And if someone doesn't have access to a phone to do that, let me know, and you can use mine to do this. And so what we're going to do, you'll see um, three columns when you click on that link. And I'm going to ask you to, in your own words, you can use a word or a phrase, what each of these means to you. Strategic, partnership, and stigma. HIV stigma or stigma in general. If you're having issues with the code, let me know and I can come do some of that. Or, or be able to do some technical assistance. <laughs> if folks need that. Everybody able to access it? Good morning. We're glad you're here. <laughs> Would you like to introduce yourself? Sorry to put you on the spot. Hello, I'm Nosti Vega. And I'm the Regional Director for the Ending the HIV Epidemic for Region 6 with the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health. So we are glad to have you. Thank you. So we just finished having a moment of gratitude and just reflecting on a relationship that brings a smile to your face and brings joy to your heart. So that's how we started. So you're already smiling, so we're in good place. Mm -hmm. um, so if everybody, is everybody able to access this here? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I'm going to switch over and prayerfully not lose my ability to share my goodness gracious. Come on. Oh, it's good. That's okay. And if you see something up there that's exactly what you would put, you can like it, you can go hard or comment. Strategic, thoughtful, planned out. I'm going to read these because I'm some of it's a little small. With intention and purpose, makes sense, well thought out, efficient, and effective. And there's some more in here. Intentional on purpose. Partnership, ability to work together for a common goal, reciprocal, mutually beneficial relationship, connection, sharing a relationship. Some folks are still there. Mutuality. Mm. Stigma. 
stigma, ignorance, personified through marginalization and dehumanization. That is true. Othering, labeling someone as something is less than typical. White cis heterosexual male, ingrained, deadly. All right, I lost my thing. Uh, it disappear on you? Yeah, can you put the thing back? Yeah, here? absolutely. Right now, if you take a photo of this QR code, we are just sharing in our own words um, what comes to mind when we hear the word strategic, partnership, and stigma. Everybody had a chance to, to add something? Someone commented on strategic on the word intentional proximity. What do you mean by that? You know, sometimes I, I'm worried about, you know, the, the proximity of what, what, the, what, how I see things as opposed to how you see things. Mm -hmm. And you know, are those, can we have conversations about, can we have courageous conversations about that and understand that we, my sense of money being privileged may be, you know, impeding on my work to kind of be offering you services. Mm -hmm. You know, so I'm wondering how to my proximity to, to your issue, to how I see it. So, you know, my, you know that's, that's just kind of the way I look at things sometimes, you know. The world I live in, or what's surrounding me, is going to affect how I'm being of service to you. Right. And recently, I had that happen where I was trying to approach and get housed, but I didn't think about that their vision of housing or how they would do it yeah. is not me because they had never actually had to pay bills before mm -hmm. or pay rent before, mm -hmm. and I just made an assumption that they would know how to do that. That's good. Thank you for that. Anybody else, anything around strategic that anybody wants to, to live that you're looking at this list? Okay, what about partnership? So it looks like the most, uh, the, the response that's gotten the most Likes is mutually beneficial relationship. How do you? How would you define that? Anybody want to share? What does that mean? I, uh, what does it look like? Posted that that mutually beneficial relationship, and it. I think it's different depending on the partnership, mm -hmm. but when each one is getting a need met, mm -hmm. uh, and there may be times when one does a little heavier lifting than the other, but I think that's okay mm -hmm. as long as there's an understanding. What about stigma? Anyone want to comment on? Spoil my ending. Who put that? <laughs> Say more, Mr. Harris. <laughs> uh, spoiled identity. Probably Chico got his trains on, mm. on stigma. But spoiled identity, we as most times we as a culture become accustomed to a certain thing and anything that is different than what we're used to, than what we have been taught and is acceptable becomes a bad thing. We label it as a bad thing. And so, and I always do the context, you know how there are some kids who want what they want, how they want, when they want, and when they don't get it, they throw a tantrum. We as groups of people sometimes do that. Anything different, we throw tantrums, which comes in the form of hate, 
which comes in the form of slurs, which comes in the form of exclusion, which comes in the form of isolating people. So a spoiled identity to say, my identity is the right identity, the best identity, and if you don't fit here, then something's wrong with you. Thank you. That was a teaser for our training, our <laughs> HIV stigma training. Yes. CBA or Margaritas, while you're here, if you'd like us to come to that was just a little snippet, a little we'll something. A little something. We'll 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 because <laughs> that's a that's like we need a whole day. Yes. But, so I'm so I don't want you all to think we're minimizing stigma, mm -hmm. HIV stigma in this session, but just recognizing like that's a mm -hmm. whew, okay. So okay. Thank you all for that. And I wanted us to do that before launching into an actual definition so that, well, they are all actual definitions, but launching into the working definition for today. Um, because it's important for us to all, so often, I think one of the key elements, and I'm happy to share this PowerPoint too, so you have it. One of the key issues we have so often is we come to the table to build partnerships and we ain't saying the same thing. Like we might be saying the same words, but they mean very, like you talk about, well, housing, safe housing. Safe housing for me will look very different from someone who's been unhoused for 10 years, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so like, we're saying the same thing, but I'm saying the same thing. So I'm glad we thank you all for that exercise. So strategic partnerships as a, and I will, I will name also the strategic partnership is really a strategic alliances came out of business practice. So we also have to acknowledge that when we're talking about community-based organizations and mission-driven groups building strategic partnerships, there are elements of the, of the core elements of strategic partnerships that are applicable, and we also have to be mindful of how we apply the lens of mission-driven, community-focused, and led work when we're talking about building those partnerships. So, will somebody read the definition for us, please? Um, strategic, strategic partnerships, a formal relationship where partners remain independent, share the benefits from, risk in, and control over joint actions, and make ongoing contributions in strategic areas. Hmm. Is there anything in this definition that's jumping out to anybody? Ongoing contributions. Ongoing contributions. Mm -hmm. Okay, say more. I just reflect on different spaces that I've been in, in any kind of work, where it's oftentimes you might start a partnership um, and might have that agreed upon you know, demo meeting, for lack of a better term. But uh, oftentimes, especially in nonprofit work, even more so social justice work, um, somewhere along the way, um, you no longer have that mutuality. One partner is still going forward and the other partner stops. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. you're not having that ongoing contribution mm -hmm. at some point. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that partner that's still going forward the onus becomes on them to yeah. reach in, or, you know, reach back and say, "Hey, are we doing this together? What's your ongoing contribution?" So I just, I just reflect on. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anything else? For me, that you continue to be independent of yourself, even when they're together, togetherness, right? Mm -hmm. But you don't lose yourself in that process. Right. right. Remaining independent. I would have guessed everything up there except I would have missed risk. Mm -hmm. That's that jumped out at me because mm -hmm. all risks are not equal, right? Mm -hmm. So if you've got some skin in the game, right. you've got to show partner. Right. Like that. And what type of risk? Do you I mean in your own experiences, as you think about venturing into partnerships or collaborations, what types of risk have you seen taken? What types of risk have you taken? What have you observed? I mean, risk could be if you put money in, is it going to pan out? That's one resource, financial resource. It is. <clears throat> what else? When we do activism work or public witness kind of work, it's a risk to put your body on the line. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sitting at home and writing a check mm -hmm. or making a donation is a different kind mm -hmm. of investment yes. than when you put your body on the yes. line or you show up. Yes. Yeah. Yes, your, your very life, mm -hmm. your very life, your livelihood, your reputation, Margarita said often. Another thing around risk that you mentioned is kind of a disproportionality is an organization, I can think of examples of organizations that may be 25 year old, well-established, large aid service organizations in partnership with small developing emerging organizations that maybe aren't as well resourced and who's really gonna, who's gonna lose the most. Um, and that can go both ways. The smaller work could lose the most, but if they're concerned about reputation and big dollars, maybe they have more to lose. So weighing risk in those situations um, 
and how privilege informs risk and partnership too. All right. And this is the CDC's definition um, of HIV stigma. So it's pretty boilerplate, but just making sure that we are all, I think we're all in alignment around what we mean when we're talking about stigma. There's levels to stigma, there's layers to stigma. Um, one of our colleagues always say stigma, you know, it's like an onion because it is a very, a very significant layers and distinctions. Um, what's important, I think, in the context as we're talking about partnership is that we have to, we have to acknowledge the difference between intention and impact. Because so often in this work, we're like, we didn't mean any harm, we didn't mean, it don't matter what you meant. You know, so just acknowledging that stigma can, can be very often un, unintended. Um, you know, when we use language that is um, degrading, that is harmful. And I had someone say to me, well, it didn't offend me. It don't matter, it, it don't matter. If it doesn't offend you as the speaker and it, and it hurts or harms someone else. So acknowledging like, and we've all, We've all in some way been, been guilty of perpetuating stigma of some kind. Um, so where is, where is the, how do we come into relationships and partnerships where we know there's been bad behavior or there's been missteps around HIV related stigma, whether it's through language or maybe the treatment of a person or a past relationship an organization has had, reputation. How do you then build relationships where we know that that has, happened or occurred? Is it possible to build trusting, strategic relationships with organizations where we know that this happens, whether it's HIV-related stigma, racial bias, homophobia, transphobia? Um, how do we do that? How do we move forward in this work? And that might be, a, that might just hang, and we'll come back to it. But it's, it's an important question because so many of our organizations have long histories mm -hmm. <laughs> and there's always a story and someone and there's been some hurt somewhere but then how do we also to end the epidemic how do we move forward in spite of that so something to hold in mind and when I, yeah when I think about stigma and the ways in which it really shows up in the world uh, one of the ways to combat it is putting a face to HIV so I was a kid um, that age I was a kid when, when Magic Johnson disclosed his status, which he didn't have to disclose. He could have retired quietly, went into the private life, and we would have never known. But it ceased from being a white gay disease in my family when Magic Johnson disclosed. And it eroded the stigma because he put a face to it. Now that's a, that's a, uh, that's a big load to carry for some people to be able to say out loud and to disclose publicly their status. Though I recognize it erodes stigma, but a lot of folks, and as a person living with HIV myself, we have internalized the stigma often. And so in some ways, part of the work is working on the self-loathing and the embodiment of stigma that some of us have created through the years so that we can be a publicly disclosed person. Yeah. But that's hard, it's really hard, but I don't, it's, there's very few ways around stigma, I think, until people actually know someone mm -hmm. who has HIV or admire someone or love someone. I don't know any way around it. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts around stigma? I think that's a really great transition to this conversation around barriers because these are, you know, looking at empirical data around what business folks say are the three biggest barriers to build these successful strategic partnerships, I think they translate so well to our work. The first being underinvestment. So you bring two partners to the table and somebody's underinvesting in this partnership. Um, and that can look a lot of ways. And I don't know if something pops to mind for any of you as you think about an underinvestment. I say this is tremendously important. Get us to the table and it's like, mm, well, I don't know if we got time to do all that. And well, I don't know if our CEO and board are really gonna be on board with it. And I don't know if we can, but what does underinvestment look like? Um, Overappropriation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that goes back to that example of maybe two very different types of organization. And maybe we're partnering because I really want to draw from your reputation, your relationship and community. You know, so just being mindful of overappropriation and then misalignment. You know, that goes back to even the conversation about proximity. It's like, are we, are we on the same page? So I'd be curious to know 
um, what you all think with these three, these three barriers, have you seen them show up in your work? And how have you worked to overcome them or have they not been overcome? I see Dwayne smiling. Yeah, I, 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 <laughs> um, so um, I, I'm Dwayne, I'm with the National AIDS Memorial. And you know, I, I, I think this is very um, <clears throat> timely and um, uh, interesting because you know, we've made a lot of investments in the Big Southern Initiative. Um, you know, working with the Southern AIDS Coalition, Westcon Strategies, Carolyn Williams Advertising, some different organizations. And as we built um, this team and provided these um, scopes of work, you know, from the different submitters and, and, and given these contracts, we're starting to realize that, you know, we've under, I think we've underinvested in some places. And so we need to go back to the table with those partners, um, you know, in conjunction with them and ask them, what do you really need and what resources? Because we will get the resources because we want to do what's right for the community. So I think we're in a, I think we're in a position to work with all these individual contractors to do what's right, but I can see how this would be a very, very difficult thing in a lot of other situations. Mm -hmm. And um, again, with the misalignment, um, and um, as Athena said, you know, with these larger organizations that are well-funded, um, they often do particularly want to go to organizations, people of color, mm -hmm. to take our contacts, which are valuable and come in our communities, um, and that's something that you know we're, we're really guarded about. We just don't want to give all that information away for free. And a lot of times, people want things from us for free. So I think it's important that you know we as organizations and, and with our contractors really work closely together and have that open line of communication to really call out when we see things that aren't going the right way and then to correct them so we can move forward. You know, or or go our separate ways. But I think we can move forward. Thank you for that. If I, yes, ma'am. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm really um, drawn to the thing about misalignment. Mm -hmm. um, the thing with with us, we have uh, the, the agency that I work for, and I'm new to to the agency, but um, it's been around a long time, and the last it it. it has presented itself as a ministry, but it's sort of downplayed. And uh, we have a new executive director, I'm new to the agency, so I, and I'm a dyke and I'm out and all that, you know. Um, but what I, what I find so challenging is the understanding of what God is all about, who God is and what the gospel calls us to do and be in the world. And, even, and you know, as, as clergy, there's this, this sense of, there's your God, my God, and everybody else's God, and the God of HIV, and the God of poverty, and the God of, you know. So it seems like such a, a huge barrier when we can't agree on the sanctity of life. And, on the presence of God. So that seems to be such a barrier in doing this work. And, you know, and I grapple with how to, who deserves to live. And I think stigma really feeds into who deserves to live and who deserves to speak for God, you know, rather than proclaim God's presence. There's this this misalignment and even what it means to be a person of faith. Mm -hmm. What does faith mean? What does God mean? What does God do? Why are we here? Um, you know, the other two, we seem to get beyond that. Mm -hmm. But when it comes down to the God place, mm -hmm. yeah, okay, quiet at the room. <laughs> that means we're thinking. Yeah. yeah, and I think what you what you've said is so is so profound because when you think about misalignment around values, mm -hmm. I don't think you I think you would assume that especially with with faith leaders or faith organization, like of course we have the same values. Right. We don't. And we don't. People don't. <laughs> and that's just so and it's like if we can't get these core 
if we don't have these core agreements, then how do we do the important work if we can't just agree that we're just here to love everybody without all the little asterisks and disclaimers? Then how do we do the work? I really appreciate you bringing that up. Because that's, that's critical as we get into this idea of even thinking about you know, applying an HIV drug stigma reduction lens to partnership building, what does that look like if we can't get this core foundational agreement in place? Um, so what I'd like to do, so these are uh, elements, um, increasing awareness, opening your doors, building community capacity, rebuilding and restoring, supporting prevention, connecting and collaborating, making resources available, these are all steps that are identified um, through a toolkit that was developed for faith communities around addressing opioid addiction um, in communities um, and the way that faith communities can respond. And this is a toolkit that HHS has put out and I'm happy to share it with you all. But it seemed very much in, a, in alignment with what we need to talk about when we're talking about HIV stigma and addressing it through, through partnerships. So I'm touching on that just to share that with you. But this is why I really want us to get into some meat and to do some work together. Um, I, I find it's helpful for folks to have like some clear steps on what to consider and to think about when, when you're building these partnerships. And this is adapted um, from IMD, which is like the big international management development folks. And so what I'm hoping is that we'll walk through these five steps and I hope that you will put in mind how you see these looking in your actual work and a partnership that you believe is necessary in your own community to eradicate or address HIV stigma. So as I'm going through these five steps, think about what it looks like. Um, just kind of internally brainstorm. And after, I've, and after we go through these five steps together, then we'll have an opportunity to really do some thought work together and actually apply this in a part to a partnership that you believe is integral and necessary in your work to, to end HIV. Um, so I'd be curious if we can also, as we're going through each of these, what does that look like with the stigma reduction lens applied? So as we walk through each of these, that's a question we'll hold, we'll hold in mind. So the first step is to strategize. And can someone read that explanation? Clearly define the areas in which partnerships should be built based on organizational strategy, values, and goals. That sounds pretty straightforward, right? That's easy peasy. Does your organization have a clear strategy, values, and goals? Is everyone in alignment and agreement? And I think it's a work, I mean, I know my organization, that's a work in progress. Like, we think we know, and we're still figuring it out. <laughs> but before you come to the table, the internal strategy has to happen. You have to be clear on, you know, what is our, what is our full strategy, which this partnership will help us to meet and what are our values and goals? How will we be aligned? So what type of values, goals, and even organizational strategy should an organization have that's talking about you know, addressing or ending HIV-related stigma and building partnerships? What should be a part of that core strategy if you're talking about addressing or ending stigma? It don't have to be that hard or complicated. It has to be a very sex positive space. Okay. Because I don't see how you can really end stigma, particularly in faith-based organizations, have all this disagreement around values and thoughts and ideas about human sexuality without starting on round one. You have to know what you mean by sex positive. You have, to, positive you have to, mm -hmm. to, to, to build out a definition that mm -hmm. you can agree upon that we will not continue the stigma or perpetuate the stigma through our own ignorance. Yeah. So having clear definitions around where you stand as an organization coming to the table. Now, at the same time, you should also be clear on those spaces where you know your organization needs to learn and grow. Because even coming into a strategic partnership, you don't have to have all the answers. But it's important to know, like, these are absolutes, and these are those things where we're like, maybe we could use some help around figuring this part out. And that, sometimes that's why partnerships are created. Because we know we need some help figuring that part out so we can do our work better. Thank you for that. And also, yes. one thing we do when you're doing your organization, very clear, but then there's a political environment around you mm -hmm. that is stopping you because mm -hmm. for me, that's the biggest issue with my role here. Mm -hmm. I put my life and calling this need to be here. 
And now I'm, I'm, I understand why I'm here. My cousin died of AIDS-related medical condition in the 90s. So I know that we can end the HIV epidemic. But then I've been sent to Bible Belt. And there's a lot of people stopping me from what I'm trying to do. So, I mean, it's very complex. Yeah. May I ask her stopping you how? Well, because I'm with the Office of the Secretary for Health. So, for starters, that's political, right? And when I try to get changes in Texas, oh my God. Mm. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, I, I'm originally from Puerto Rico, right? So I see things different because I come from a very small island where we have to try to figure it out right there. I'm not able to drive away to go anywhere. We have to figure it out in Puerto Rico. So we have done a lot of things. And when I come here, I'm like, oh, my future changed the world, you know? <laughs> I'm being supported by the Office of the Secretary of Health. <laughs> I came here where the real admiral supported me. And I'm like, why is so hard, right? I wanted to talk to the group of pregnant adolescents when I first got to Texas, and I was told, you're not having sex. You cannot <laughs> talk to <laughs> them. To that level. So I went like, what? Did you say pregnant? <laughs> 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 yes. And, and, and I'm a clinical psychologist who specializes working with sexual abuse victims. Mm -hmm. My youngest victim was four years old. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be uh, reactive, I want to be proactive. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, they're stopping me. Mm -hmm. And it's very, very. Difficult. Also, talking earlier about the fact that right now, Facts and figures don't matter. Mm -hmm. There's no, there's no data sheet you gonna share that's gonna sway folks um, because everything is ideology driven. And they, I hate when call it the Bible Belt, but the Bible ain't the problem. Mm -hmm. It's these folks and how they clobber folks with it anyway. But you're right. You're in a space where the the, the justification for the stigma, the discrimination is well, the word says no, but it don't say that. But anyway. But yeah, so what does that look like? That's a that's a great that's a great point. When you're in a space where you know there are limitations due to political situations, do you, how do you pivot then? How do you find spaces to create change within the context of this? Because we our work is all in the South, so we know. So how do you how do you pivot? What types of relationships can you build that will allow you to do meaningful work within the context of? And you're in the government, so I know that's a whole other thing. But yes. And to her point, you sit here thinking about that China she's talking about, you know, I live in a state where Sarah Huckabee can be the next governor. So what am I to think? You know, this is the governor of Arkansas, could be governor of Arkansas. Mm -hmm. That most likely will be. Mm -hmm. And so therefore the work that I'm trying to do is now how I'm gonna deal with her mm -hmm. and all that comes with her, you know, for the work that we're trying to do. So but you know, I, I sympathize when you talk about this political landscape that that's to come. So now I've got to pivot to figure out how am I gonna work with that. Yeah. And what and what does that mean? Yeah. You know, does that could she have cut off resources? Could she, you know, what could what legislation could she propose right. or sign off on right. that we may not be ready to deal with? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, we've already got you know, we already know that the Roe versus Wade is you know, hanging in the balance yep. there. So there's a lot that's hanging for those of us who are doing, you know, sexual health work mm -hmm. all the way around. Mm -hmm. And then we've got to deal with, you know, stigma and all the other things. Mm -hmm. So the political landscape for, for those of us in states like that, and, and in Texas, mm -hmm. um, it's insurmountable sometimes. Mm -hmm. We don't know what we're going to do yeah. or how. Yeah. I mean, it, it feels like this is one of those moments. We talk about the necessity of de-siloing HIV. There are a whole lot of us in different causes who should be working together. There's also now the op there should be these opportunities to engage. We talk about public-private partnerships. Where are the corporations in this who may also have something to lose, something different to lose? But like finding those opportunities to build partnerships where they're. Um, where the change that is that is threatened and upon us will affect each of us in different ways and finding that that common thread i think is going to be so important for unnecessary for us and that just has not been the way that we have we've had we've been so self-reliant in this work 
Like we can all depend on them. Like we got us. Mm. And now we have to figure out how do we then, how do we now spread in a way where we are engaging with other folks. And I think that's that's an important conversation we need to keep having. Um, absolutely. I got I didn't mean to make a face while you were talking, but he gave me a 10 minute sign. I'm like, 10 minutes? So that's why I was looking like that. <laughs> We don't do what we do. We'll okay. Okay. Twenty minutes late, but anyway. Okay. So we'll get through these five things, and this may, but you know, number one took us a while. I'm glad it did. But the second step: search, screen, select. Who'd like to read this one? This goes to what we were just talking about. Consider the full ecosystem of potential partners, identifying a good fit with your culture, competencies, and capabilities. (laughs) Know your Mm -hmm. non-negotiables. Know those things you can't move on that we were talking about. Mm-hmm. What does this look like in the context of eradicating HIV stigma? When you think about the ecosystem and also what would be a good fit or necessary? What would be non-negotiables if we're talking about addressing stigma? One that comes up for me is, of course, language but also meaningful involvement of people living with and impacted by HIV and AIDS, mm-hmm. obviously, right? You know, affirm, affirming the total person. Mm-hmm. Yes. You, know, you gotta bring everybody to the table. Yeah. 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 And it's bad all over, not just the South. You know. mm-hmm. Cause we're Seattle just, got issues too. Seattle huh? got a bunch of issues. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Everybody's crazy. Everybody's messing up shit. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, search, screen, select. Okay, let's go on to structure. Um, This was someone spoke to this earlier. You need to know what you're establishing. Is this going to be short term as we're doing an event together? Is this going to be short term as we're applying for this grant together for this one project? Is this going to be a long term strategy? We want to get a law change. Let's partner to get this law change. It's important to know and to be flexible if it needs to change. But what so often happens, we create, I like your organization, y'all like y'all too, come on, let's do something together. And then y'all get to the table and like, well, what are we doing? And how do we know we've succeeded? How do we measure success in this partnership? And how do we know who's holding what weight and who's responsible for what? So structure is just much better. Put, put it on paper, put it, in, put it in writing. Even if it seems like a small partnership, what we have also found is like for smaller organizations, it helps to build their capacity to understand, oh, I should be in a agree- I should have a written agreement. Mm-hmm. And also that expectation, oh, maybe we should be getting paid to do this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, stop giving away all your stuff, like Wayne was saying, you know? Um, so understanding structure is critical. Number four, start and stabilize. Somebody read that for us. Identify a specific issue, goal, for the partnership, and leave room to revisit as challenges arise. Yeah. Stabilize it by being clear on what it is you're working to accomplish. So we're not coming to each meeting like now, what are we doing again? Or something changed, so maybe we shouldn't be doing it. Let's move some, but let's be intentional. Um, Knowing your specific issue, your goals for the partnership up front, and being clear that we're gonna have to probably make some adjustments. It's like we said about those relationships that made us smile earlier. Sometimes them puppies will chew up your shoes. <laughs> and sometimes them friends are not gonna pay you back. When you, you know, I mean, it, you have these loving relationships that don't mean they're perfect. And so it's important even in strategic partnerships to be able to leave room for that flexibility and to know like, okay, maybe we need to revisit our focus. Um, all right. So what does that look like in the context of our work around ending HIV-related stigma. And we talk about leaving room to revisit as challenges arise, or as someone in that other organization you're partnering with posts something crazy on social media, Mm -hmm. or the CEO who you really love working with is now gone, and now this board chair is interim and they're crazy. Or, I mean, just, I mean, these are the things that happen. <laughs> oh, no, we don't do that anymore because he's gone. We don't do that. We don't. Okay. Mm-hmm. And what does that look like? How do you can, how do you start and stabilize the work so it's not about a person? Mm-hmm. Because so often our organizations are about a person. Mm-hmm. 
usually because a person's created the organization out of necessity. Um, and then, it, you know, a lot of founders don't know how to, you know, don't build the sustainability in the organization. So how do we start and stabilize? Because if we don't stabilize it, we don't get it done. And we don't want to start and not finish it unless it's, if that's the intent because we've made a decision or a pivot in another way. Okay. So the last step, study and steer. We'll read that one for us. Be clear on who holds responsibility for holding partners accountable. Everyone agrees on who steers the process. Who's on first? Mm -hmm. Now be clear around that doesn't necessarily mean the person steering holds the power, right? Mm -hmm. There can be shared power. Somebody got to steer though, because if everybody's doing it, nobody's doing it, right? And there are a lot of different things, you lot of different little tools and acronyms you can use to decide who's doing what. But so often in partnerships, you know, if you look at this from a business lens, there might be a strategic partnership portfolio where there's folks that's all they do. And in a lot of our organizations, we're now seeing like a partnership manager, or maybe it's community engagement, or whatever it may be called. But there has to be clarity for all the partners. Who's going to be scheduling the meetings? Who's going to be sending out the notes? Who's going to be tracking our progress? All of those things, making sure we're clear that we are, that we know who's doing what and steering the process. And the study piece of this is also about everyone engaged being equipped and understanding what it is we're working towards accomplishing. So it's not just about, well, yes, we're in partnership, but they're the ones doing all the things and they're holding all of the information around how we're, how we're moving forward. Okay, so those are the five steps I was hoping to share with you all and I hope that that was um, helpful. What I was thinking we could do for a moment is to think about what partnership would you create with those, and that's not the five steps, that's the things from earlier, but what partnership would you create today um, to end HIV stigma? Thinking about your own work in your own community, is there a partnership that you've been craving to dig into, or a partnership that's been a little stagnant, or just one that's just dawned on you, like, oh, we really should be doing something with them. And I'm wondering if any, if any of you have anything in mind. And I'll go back to this slide. I, I've been trying to um, what we want what I, what I want to see happen is for us to partner with churches in in Washington State we've done well uh, in terms of the epidemiology of AIDS uh, in HIV because it looks good in, in the numbers but how do we go back and get the ones that we forgot you know how do we go back and get the 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 high the the, the fruit that's on the at the top of the tree. And um, so I think our challenge is how to build partnerships with people who are willing to go into the into the trenches. And you know, I think that's the biggest thing. Mm -hmm. But how do we get the those that don't nobody really want to live in the first place? Because we're talking, we're talking so often about <coughs> partnership in the context of organizations, mm -hmm. leadership, mm -hmm. and not partnership with the community itself. Right. Mm -hmm. And how do we facilitate that and make that happen? You know, we come to conferences and spaces like this. Um, you know, Dazon Dixon Diallo from <coughs> calls this choir practice. Mm -hmm. right. We have these conferences, right? Mm -hmm. Like these. Are, this is people, you know? So it's like, how do we reach the folks who aren't in the choir already and get them engaged in these, conver in these conversations? Very important, yes. And I would add that we are practicing in the choir, but we have different choirs, mm. right? Because the people who are at biomedical aren't here. Right. And the people that were at the National uh, Latinx HIV Conference aren't here. And so I think that in social justice organizing, there's a lot of emphasis in faith-based community organizations and just spaces. But when it comes to HIV, it's like either or or. Yeah. And then, then it makes it harder for the people that are living with HIV 
or those who are advocating at the forefront to be able to navigate all these different spaces that are created when in reality the folks who have the money for the funding the church leaders also need to be able to sit down and have the conversation mm -hmm. to make sure that the treatment is not just in the medical care space mm -hmm. because we all know that not everyone has access to the medical field and so being able to merge that and create that partnership is going to be important, but it will really take a lot for everyone who thinks they're above the community to actually have some humility to sit together and not just say, well, my institution is the leading whatever, whatever. I don't care if you have CPAR money for the rest of your life. And I also don't care if you are the highest of the highest in the clergy you still have to sit down and have this conversation or else the community will not actually benefit. Mm -hmm. And so making sure that we have those partnerships is going to be important in the same way that social justice has been able to involve all of these players. Yeah. Right. It's like everybody talks about the speaking truth to power, mm -hmm. but we got a whole bunch of lies that the leaders of organizations are living themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, they can't deal with the stigma because yeah. they're going home, you know, banging some little boy in the choir law, yeah. right? Yeah. And, the, you know, and, and if we establish the relationships with the churches, they're going to have to, their stuff's going to be out there too. So how do you get past, past the personal yeah. to get into the proclamation or into the professional? Because the personal, very often when it comes down to people of faith, the personal is what's guiding what they're doing, yeah. you know, yeah. they're telling the lies, and you know, and we get in a room, they're so afraid their lies gonna come out, right. you know, they're gonna see that little boy that they had last week at the table when they trying to, you know, at the at the the booth table, right? So, tell us what to do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't have that slide. <laughs> but how do we? That's account. That's the need for accountability. Mm -hmm. And how do we create accountability, particularly in our faith spaces, where you know that this is happening? Everybody knows, mm -hmm. and nobody does anything. Which happens in our family. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows. Yeah. I know. And it's also about belonging, though. So because if you were yeah. able to belong in the community, in the church or whatever community you want to be a part of, and be your authentic self, yeah, you wouldn't have to have a lie. Mm -hmm. So, but because I feel like I don't belong, I have to play these two different roles mm -hmm. at the same time. Mm -hmm. So then, the stigma drives the secrecy. Mm -hmm. It's a never-ending cycle yeah. that we're talking about. Also, the stigma drives people being afraid to be at the table. Yep. Yeah. Because I'm here because CDC has assigned money for everyone to be at the table together designing a plan to end the HIV era. And when I go and look for the meeting is happening, people are not there. So I went into the street to figure out what was on the ground. Do they are the people? So we interviewed 900 one on one conversation with people. And they were going like, I don't see myself in that space. I'm afraid to go there. You know what? I'm illegal here. Mm -hmm. And this is happening in the Department of Health. And there's a security guard. How do I know that that's not immigration? Mm -hmm. And you with that uniform, who are you? Mm -hmm. And I have to tell them, I'm in some conference. I speak Spanish, so let's have a conversation. They have some coffee. But yeah, people are afraid. And people still do not know that this document is a living document. So all of you, if you're part of one of the priority jurisdictions, you could go to the Department of Health and tell them, I want to see the EHE plan, and you know what? What I want and what I need is not part of that plan, let's change it. Because CDC is telling them, we're going to give you the money, but it's going to be based on what all of you are saying that is needed. So you need to take that space on the table. I do talk in the clinic because I tell them, priority population, 13 to 34. Where are the 13-year-olds? 
they could be there with their parents because there's a lot of parents that are supporting that LGBT child. So go there at the table and go, let's change this plan. There's Pacha. Why is it a Pacha? A 13-year-old and a mother. Where is the young people that should be there? And you know what? You have the opportunity to be a member of Pacha, this presidential advisory committee that are making plans. So it's just requesting Hey, I'll give you my email if you want it, and you send me the information, and the Secretary of Health will try it. So I, I believe we need to come to a close. Um, since I, they didn't come back, but I'm gonna be respectful. I got 15 minutes ago. Um, you all, you you've created space for a lot of food for thought. And your parting thought around why people aren't in these spaces that are so HIV focused and them not seeing themselves because they don't see other aspects of their lives in those spaces. And how do we balance the ending of stigma with acknowledging that HIV does not stand alone when we're talking about the full range of people's lived experience and um, the work that we have ahead of us. So I'm gonna challenge us to consider building a partnership with an organization that is not HIV focused in its mission to get us a step closer to ending HIV related stigma. We're not gonna end it, we're just talking to ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so it's gonna be critical for us to do that. Um, it's good to see you, Dr. Burley. How are you? I'm working. <laughs> glad you come in and carry Goodman, acknowledging the VIPs and the restaurants. <laughs> We're very glad y'all are here, but before we leave, are there any parting thoughts, anything from our conversation today that you're gonna carry with you um, and carry into your work? And I will gladly, I'd love to get folks contact information. I'll share these slides as well. Yes, Jay. Just one of the things that I, I wanted to share was that um, I'm always purposely a subversive in, in my approach in dealing with church leadership um, and people who invite us into their space because I know that they have a personal story to tell. And I, I, I get on them in a subversive way to try to get them to extend their own pastoral care with their community by coming off of their perch and coming down and just doing a stitch because they didn't open their doors because they didn't have a story. They all have a story. And I think an example of that was last night when Dr. Matthews yes. was able to tell her story. But we, we opened that space for her. Because all of us who work in this field have, have a personal story. And that also helps to connect with the communities that we are working with. If Bishop so-and-so comes down off their perch, comes into a room, and is across the table from a trans member of their, their church doing a stitch, I know that makes a difference. I may not be able to qualify or quantify, but it's that thing. I can see the light going off in those leaders' heads. So I just wanted to share that. I'm so glad you did. You gave us like a tangible, actionable thing we can do, which is identify a faith space in our community or a partner we can invite to do panel making with us in our communities. So I encourage you all to see Jada um, so we can establish some panel making workshops and bring folks to the table who may not usually come down and just to do a stitch yeah. to your point. It's just a little, it's a baby step, mm -hmm. but it opens up the opportunity for so much. I really appreciate you. That's a good way to close us out. Thank you very, very much. I got to do some shameless plugging. We have a conference coming up in August in Atlanta, Georgia, SOS 2022, the Black Print. This is the conference. The con we're closing. We're finished. I promise. This is the conference focused on Southern Black LGBTQ health wellness, power, culture, and we want y'all there. So do, sharing this as well. Um, before folks head out, I'd love to get contact information um, so we can follow up with you and I can share these 
slides and here's my info if you ever want to reach out. I know Rodriguez and DH would love to chat with you too. And thank you so much for participating in our session this morning. Thank All right. You. Thank y'all. Appreciate it. One of the things I'm going to take is that as I look at these steps, you're, you're you. watching the state? Yes. Yeah. So, wow. so thank you for all your work. Okay. Uh, 